What do scientists really know? When and how do they know they know? What are their certainties, but also, and above all, their uncertainties, their questions, their doubts? What do they do with them? Hello, I am Anne-Laure Ganac. I'm a journalist at the Humanities College of the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, and you are listening to a podcast, Are You Sure?, Yes, yes, you are listening to a podcast. Are you sure is its title? And this is a question that will guide me to meet the people who do science at EPFL to take the pulse of their certainties and uncertainties. Henrik Ronald. Uh, I'm a Danish by origin, uh, where I was born uh, half a century ago. I uh, did my studies at the University of Copenhagen, where I obtained my uh, PhD in 2000. Uh, And since then, I moved around uh, a bit in the world. Uh, I ended up in Switzerland at EPFL, where I founded the Laboratory for Quantum Magnetism in 2007. Outside science, uh, I also have a family. I have two children and starting to think about going to university themselves. Thank you, Enric Ranoff, for uh, accepting my invitation. First, could you tell us a little bit more about what you are doing in your lab? What is quantum magnetism? So magnetism, we all know magnetism in the sense of the magnet that you can fix something to, to the fridge door with, with an attractive force. In fact, inside materials, uh, magnetism is an, an effect from quantum mechanics where the electrons, they form a magnetic moment. Uh, so in principle, all magnetism uh, is quantum mechanical in nature. But what we are interested in are uh, more complex magnets than just the fridge magnets we put on the door, where basically we can have uh, representations uh, and, and functionalities that are directly due to the quantum mechanical effects. So the studies involve uh, big machines, uh, big facilities, uh, and also uh, going to very low temperatures. So we typically work at minus 270 degrees centigrade, or if you want, uh, less than one degree above the absolute zero temperature. What makes this fairly new field of research so important, according to you? Well, it's actually actually not a new field. Uh, So... um, Quantum mechanics was discovered about a a hundred years ago, uh, among Niels Bohr, uh, Heisenberg and others. Uh, And from the very beginning, uh, they realized that that magnetism was an important side consequence of of, uh, electrons uh, uh, moving in orbits. Uh, But uh, it continues to be an interesting field. Uh, And the reason for that is basically we, as scientists as a whole, Uh, we're challenged by describing and controlling quantum mechanical effects. And it turns out that uh, magnets are an ideal arena, if you want, a a, a Lego set for studying such quantum mechanical effects. Uh, So we can can, uh, sort of uh, create very simple situations uh, where we understand roughly the ingredients and we can still uh, study then uh, the the effects that happen due to the quantum effects. Are you working with any certainty in this uh, field of research, uh, Henrik Ronoff? What we do is that we write down theoretical models. And so by definition, because we define the theoretical model, uh, the the model is certain. And the the difficulty is that we have no way of exactly solving the model. So in school, when you learn find x, there's a solution, and you can write down the exact solution to a problem of finding x. Uh, Whereas here, we have have mathematical models, uh, which we simply cannot solve, not even with the biggest computers uh, on Earth. And instead, what we have to do is that we have to make approximations, assumptions, and then see if, um, if we make this approximation or this assumption, can we then actually predict the behavior? Uh, of, of the system. And so the uncertainty comes in in the, in the form of the approximations we make and the, the, the theoretical tools we're using to then solve the, the approximate uh, problem. So this means that you have to admit and to work with an irreducible gap between the theoretical model and the reality of the phenomenon, right? 
Exactly. Uh, basically, uh, because we cannot solve the problem exactly, we have to make approximations, and that can be theoretical approximations, or it can be, and what, that's actually what we do in my lab, is that we do experimental approximations. So when the theorists cannot solve the model, we can find a material that represents this model, uh, and we can then do measurements uh, to, to study what are the phenomena that comes out of this model, which can then feed back into how the theorists uh, try to uh, develop their uh, understanding. Why did you choose this field of research, Henry Kronoff? What was your first goal? So uh, it's, it's a, actually a funny story. I was study, I, when I was studying, I was very interested in a different field of research. Uh, and one day in the library, I saw a, a, I saw a book similar, with, with basically with the same color, back, color, back cover and color as the one I was currently reading. And that book was called Rare Earth Magnetism. And it turned out to be written by two professors at my university in Copenhagen. And so I started reading it and found it really fascinating because there was this interplay between theoretical predictions and experimental measurements. And so I went to these two professors and asked whether I could do my master project uh, in this field, uh, which I could. And then that led on to a PhD and, and then the path was set down, down this road. So essentially, my choice of scientific uh, field is based on the, on the color of a, book, of a book cover. Is Are You Sure a question you often ask yourself, Henrik Ronoff, and when and why? What about? I'm not sure uh, whether Are You Sure is, is the correct question to ask in the context of science. Uh, science is basically uh, working on the, on the frontier, the borderline between the known and the unknown. And, and so the moment we become sure in science, we write it down in a textbook, and now it's basically no longer science, it's accounting. Uh, and, and science is about extending the, 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 the border of what is known. So, so I think the more interesting question is actually, uh, what do we not know, uh, than, than the question about what do we know. Uh, but now, since, since you ask, um, I think, all the time when we do our research, we, we see a phenomenon, we hypothesize about it, we try to make guesses uh, about could it be this way, could it be that way, and this is, this is essentially how we develop our hypothesis. And then what we do is that we devise ways of testing the hypothesis. If the hypothesis passes the test, then it seems more plausible to be true. Uh, and if you want, and that's probably what we mean by can you be sure, but actually, and this is sort of slightly philosophical, you can actually never prove a theory. The only thing you can do is you can prove that a theory is wrong. You can never actually prove that it's the one and only theory. Uh, the only thing you can say is that my theory currently describes all the experiments that have been done to date. So therefore, you can never be sure. So this means, Henrik Ronoff, that we are wrong when we are waiting for scientists to give us some certainties, some things we can rely on as we have seen it during this uh, past uh, few months, uh, during the crisis, right? I think actually there's been a large number of scientists that have done very good in communicating. Uh, so obviously uh, virology and epidemics is not my field of research. Uh, but uh, if people would listen carefully to what is actually being said, the scientists are uh, always stating that, uh, and that, that's how science is, you have a certain number of observations, and based on these observations, you make often a, a statistical uh, model, and this statistical model can now make predictions or conclusions which, are, which have attached to them the statistical uncertainty that's involved in, in uh, that, that comes with the fact that there's a finite number of measurements. And so uh, the population should not request of scientists to say this is 100% true, because the scientist would actually be lying if he said this is 100% true. Well, maybe we should have started from here, Henry Ronoff. What is a truth? So a truth, uh, for me, is a mathematical truth. So mathematics is uh, that particular domain of science which, where you can't really talk about truths. So essentially, mathematics is a very strict uh, uh, language uh, where you, you say, if this, that, and that condition are fulfilled, then by doing a mathematical theorem, we can prove that this other thing here is true. 
Um, so if you take Pythagoras, if you have a, a triangle with one right angle, then if you take the square of the two shorter sides, a squared plus b squared, that is equal to the, the square of the longest side, c squared. And, and so that's the truth. Anything, everything else is a statistical probability. So if you go to any other field of science, go to uh, biology, life science, physics, uh, what we do is we make observations, and based on these observations, we develop the most plausible uh, explanation for the phenomenon. But as I said before, uh, you cannot actually prove that it's true. You can just say that this model has theory, or this description explains all the observations we've made today. But maybe tomorrow someone will make an observation that does not explain it. You have already brought many contributions to your field of research. Tell us about the one you are the proudest of. What, what I'm the most proud of is actually the various PhD students I've educated. Uh, but in terms of discoveries, uh, I made actually doing my own PhD. I, I, I discovered one small effect. It's not a huge phenomenon, but a small effect that it's really me who discovered, and which I'm actually studying until today. So. Uh, it was so. What makes me proud of it? It was that uh, I discovered this phenomenon, and then with a variety of collaborators over the years, we have been exploring, and we are reaching further and further in, in the in the understanding of this. And so, it's one quantum mechanical phenomenon in a particular model for which we have uh, materials that, that they represent. Um, what makes it interesting to other people is that. Uh, it may be related to a phenomenon called superconductivity, which is the ability to conduct electric current or electric energy without any loss in, in, um, at, at quite high temperatures. It's still below zero temperature, but at quite high temperatures is in, in a family of compounds based on copper oxides. Uh, and, and so it, it adds to uh, my appreciation of this phenomenon that it may actually have uh, an, an influence on this uh, quite interesting uh, macroscopic quantum effect. So would you say that you have discovered a new, well, reality about quantum magnetism? No, it's simply um, the small effect. So, you know, it would be similar to if you were studying a particular uh, family of animals, uh, then, you, then you realize, well, actually, there's another related family that behaves slightly differently. So in, in the big picture, it's a very small thing that, that only the, the few people who are interested in that field would find interesting. And that's the same for me. Uh, so I, I, my pride comes out of the, if you want, the quality of the, the study, not the importance. Are you sure the research you're doing is worth spending so much time and so much money also? Is it a question you often ask yourself, Henrik Ranoff? It is actually. Uh, I mentioned we use uh, quite large uh, machines for some of our studies. Of course, we're not the only ones using the, these machines, but for instance, right now in, in Sweden, uh, there has been constructed something called the European Spallation Source. So this is a bit like an, an X-ray facility, uh, but for, for particles called neutrons. And this is a, a joint European project that costs 2 billion euros. Uh, Switzerland is a member at, at 4% uh, contribution. Uh, and so there will be about uh, 8,000 scientists in Europe who will benefit directly uh, from this facility. And if you divide that out, you still you realize that actually that's a significant investment for each of these 8,000 scientists. Um, of course, the facility will be there for many years. And you can ask the qu you can ask yourself the question: Is this really worth it? I think the answer is uh, multidimensional because uh, some of what we do uh, is actually. Um, directly relevant uh, to society and societal challenges, helping to find new materials for better energy conversion, etc. Um, and, and so uh, in, that, in that sense, you can make a relatively straightforward uh, budgetary calculation. Well, if we manage to help solve the, the energy problem or if we manage to help so uh, solve the, uh, an, another societal challenge, then you can directly put a, a number on it and see, see return on investment. Uh, but what I have spoken most about uh, so far is basically the, the, big, the fundamental understanding of, of the universe, so basically the quantum mechanical uh, laws of nature. And, and that, if, if you want, the, the return on investment is actually rather similar to, to art and philosophy. 
since we're humans, we can think, we want to explore what's around us. And so to some extent, part of the, the, the funding that goes into basic sciences should actually rather be compared to the funding that goes into uh, art, uh, et cetera. So basically, it, it's, a, it's a broadening of, of humanity. Well, is this argument enough to convince people of the usefulness of uh, fundamental research today? Uh, there has certainly been a trend uh, in, the, in the past decade or two decades towards more and more applied research, where also the, the, the funding for science uh, is becoming much more targeted. So now uh, in many countries, if you simply write that I want to do fundamental research because I'm curious, you will not get funded. You have to say, oh, I'm going to solve problem X, Y, Z in, in, the, in the list of grand, cha- grand societal challenges. And then, and then you know, two years later, there, there's a new directive, and now suddenly we have to research something else. Uh, whereas basic science is actually something that that leads to uh, understanding and, and leads to breakthroughs, also in societal challenges, 20, 30, 40 years down the road. So uh, there is a certain degree of short-sightedness uh, amongst funding bodies um, around the world uh, these days. Uh, luckily, in Switzerland, uh, actually, the Swiss Science Foundation in particular, they still uh, appreciate fundamental science. And so I think in Switzerland, we have a very good um, place to do fundamental research. Well, you sound pretty convinced about uh, your role as a scientist. Uh, what about teaching? What does it bring you? Teaching is actually really nice because uh, during, when we do our research, we can end up in a tiny little corner with very complex uh, but very specialized uh, problems uh, that we'll work on for several years um, and in which, as I mentioned before, only very few people are really interested in. Whereas when you teach, it brings you back to the basics uh, because now you have to take uh, your young students and you have to explain sort of the fundamentals of physics uh, to them. And that gives also uh, there's also an opportunity to sort of re- revisit and, and uh, reappreciate the, the basic uh, elements of physics uh, yourself. Uh, for me, that's very enjoyable. Also, you know, when you when you teach something to people, uh, to students, and they get excited because they understand it, they want to know more. Uh, so that's that's very rewarding. Um, I'm not sure I used the the sort of the undergraduate teaching directly in my research, uh, but certainly um, uh, after becoming a professor, starting to teach. I think my, my talks, also my scientific talks, have become more pedagogic. Uh, perhaps I used to more present to a much more a narrow audience, whereas now I realize that actually most of us are interested in, in, in the broad and, and, and general aspects of the research. Today, what is your biggest certainty, Henrik Ronoff? I think my biggest certainty is that in, in all the different fields we're researching, there, we have we have much more to discover than what we've discovered so far. So basically, the, the, that there's much new to be seen. In which way does your work as a scientist affect your certainties as a man in your everyday life? So perhaps the fact that when we do science, uh, we, we realize how little we really understand and how much there is left to understand. And that brings sort of a humbleness uh, which you can you can bring with you to other situations you don't need to always be on top of the entire situation and understand everything it's sufficient to say okay i i understand i'm i I can i can master and control this aspect of my life of my uh, of my surroundings and so that's where i will contribute let's say more specifically uh, in in the political uh, regime uh, I, I take particular interest in, in at that level where I can contribute, uh, whereas I, I find uh, basically I, I put less effort into following uh, elements and aspects of life that I cannot control in a way. Thank you, Henrik Ranoff. Well, thank you for the time. Bye-bye. It was Henrik Ranoff, professor at the Laboratory of Quantum Magnetism at the EPFL. To be continued, a new episode of your podcast, Are You Sure?, to meet another scientist from the EPFL exploring the world of science, truth, certainties, and uncertainties.